wages at the bottom in the United States are the same level that they were 60 years ago. Uh, so for those at the bottom, there's been no increase for more than a half a century. And uh, average income of the bottom 90 percent, we're not talking about the bottom here, the bottom 90 percent have essentially stagnated uh, for more than a quarter century. Uh, Forty years ago, President Reagan talked about a set of reforms that were supposed to lead to faster economic growth and through a mysterious process called trickle-down economics, everybody would benefit. And there were a whole set of reforms, I put that in quotation marks, reforms that were uh, uh, globalization, financialization, you know, and, and advances in technology, all of which were supposed to make us a better performing economy. And we prided ourselves about knowing how to manage the economy better. We were so much smarter. And what happened after all these reforms and with all that knowledge? Our economy grew more slowly than it did in the decades after World War II. The proceeds of that growth all went to a very few people at the top. Inequality grew and stagnation was, was pervasive and a lot of people saw their incomes uh, go down. We are at a moment in history where confidence in, in our, market democracy, uh, our market economy and our democracies is being questioned around the world. And one of the reasons it's being questioned is because our economies have not been serving a majority of our citizens. And it just reminds us the imperative to uh, make our economy serve our society. To get an economy, a market economy that serves society, we have to rewrite those rules. And uh, markets uh, don't exist in a vacuum. They have to be structured. They are structured by a political process. And that's why politics is so important. And really, uh, the call of the book is to say, uh, let's go ahead on this uh, agenda of restructuring the rules of the market economy, a political process. And here are some guidelines of how to think about it. It's the beginning of a conversation. When you created the Eurozone, you took away the interest rate and exchange rate mechanism. And then the growth and stability said you also can't use fiscal policy. So monetary policy wouldn't work, fiscal policy, exchange rate policy didn't work. The result of that was you got deeper economic downturns. Europe had focused in a way on old problems rather than the problems of the future. The rules of the game were supposed to mitigate externalities. They didn't focus on the right externalities. And the result of this is that they led to divergence rather than convergence. So what we've seen in the recent years is that the countries, rather than getting closer together, the rich have been growing and the poor have been declining and the disparity between the richest and the poorest within Europe have been growing. Just at a time when we should have been strengthening social protections and the rules of bargaining to help workers, we went the other direction. And that, 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 that led to uh, greater uh, inequality in market income. I mean, so much so that actually, in some of the European countries, the inequality in market income is as bad as it is in the United States. You know, fortunately, Europe has more redistribution so the people are not left as unprotected as they are in the United States. Europe is, has become more competitive. Uh, markups are smaller, uh, concentration is less. So policies do make a difference. And, and, and uh, uh, one of the reasons why there's less inequality in Europe than in America has to do with uh, greater enforcement of competition. Vestiger's uh, bringing uh, successfully the case against uh, Google uh, for its anti-competitive uh, practices in advertising are 
you know, the third case with very large fines uh, and from what I could gather, totally deserved. And there's been a, a, a hesitancy of American antitrust authorities to take on the big tech companies. Thank <laughs> you.